Good evening, good afternoon, everyone. I'll just wait for a few people as they're entering the room. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Wendy Mitchell. I am a journalist and film festival consultant, and I'm so thrilled to be moderating this session today about the making of Chernobyl. It's part of the BAFTA television, The Sessions, supported by TCL. And it's a virtual series to celebrate and learn about some of the nominees and nominated programs for this year's Virgin Media BAFTA TV Awards and the British Academy Television Craft Awards. Um, Chernobyl has a whopping 14 nominations across those two events, um, all well-deserved. I'm so thrilled to be speaking uh, to the creators of the show that just you know, blew me away, quite frankly. Um, this was one of the most impactful pieces of work I've ever seen, and I hope you all agree, and there's so much to talk about. So these virtual events are part of BAFTA's learning work to share expertise from film, TV, and games with audiences far and wide. You can check out BAFTA.org and BAFTA's social media channels for more activity and news. We are streaming this event on YouTube and Facebook, and you can rewatch it there. Um, and you can also join the conversation on social media by using the hashtag BAFTA TV sessions. So also this, uh, I have thousands of questions for this group, but we really want to make sure that the audience is asking your questions as well. Please use the Q&A function on Zoom down there at the bottom. I think we all know how Zoom works by now. Uh, and you can also ask questions via YouTube and Facebook. I'm also really happy to let everybody know that closed captioning is available now. You can turn that on at the bottom of your screen. Uh, without further ado, my goodness, the Chernobyl team is here in full effect. Uh, I'm so glad we can welcome the writer, Craig Mazin. Hi. Hello. We have the director, Johan Renk. Hello, Johan. We have actor Jared Harris. Welcome, Jared. And last but not least, the executive producer, Jane Featherstone. So thank you all for joining us uh, remotely, obviously. You're all safe in your offices and homes. Uh, but really great that you could join us today to talk a bit more about this remarkable project. Um, of course, I have to start with Craig. All we right. always have to. That's where this show started. We have to start with you. Um, I, you know, I've read that you started researching it, the, this disaster again, sort of in, in 2014. And why was it that you thought this would make a compelling story for now or for 2014 now? Sure. Um, yeah, the world changed uh, quite rapidly between 2014 and the time we were in production, much less the time that the show came out. But there is a certain universal basis for my interest, and that essentially was a fascination with our inability as humans to wrestle with the truth. We just really struggle with it. And the story of Chernobyl was, on the one hand, um, um, about that failure of humans. But on the other hand, there was also this incredible celebration of humans, that people did things in the wake of Chernobyl that I just hadn't considered or heard of. We know about stories of heroism from war because the stories of war are told over and over and over. Mostly the stories of war that we hear are stories from the perspective of the West, whether it's the Americans or the British. Um, but here was a war that we didn't even know happened. And it happened in the nation that we considered our enemy. And it happened with people that we considered to be um, foreign to us. And it turns out they were not foreign to us. And the citizens themselves were not our enemy. And the heroism that they showed, sorry, that they showed, not just rivals, but I think exceeds so much of what we have seen on screen from you know our representations of history. So it was this interesting combination of the worst of things and the best of things, the worst of humanity and the best of humanity. And that's what drew me in. And then uh, unfortunately the world insists on making Chernobyl relevant. <laughs> it's, it's very upsetting. I, I don't like it. I want it to stop happening. I remember you know, after we put the show out, obviously there was this um, sense that the, there was a global war on the truth. And then also we are living inside of this time of climate change and denial 
and now we're in a time of COVID and denial. And uh, these things keep happening. So I'm, I'm, I'm distressed. Honestly, you want to be relevant as an artist, but I don't want to be this relevant. This is upsetting. No, and I think we'll, it'll be nice, not nice, but it'll be relevant to come back and talk about sort of the reflections on the show now a bit later. Oh, we've already got some good questions coming in and I, I'm going to try to jump to these as I had some of them are, you know, right aligned with what I wanted to ask you. And there's already a question coming in um, from William Turner about, um, did you ever think about making it as a feature film? Did you feel like you had more freedom in doing it as a TV show? So Craig, you know, back when you started thinking this is an important story to tell, did you, did you know it would be episodic? Oh yeah, no, there's no other way to do it. I, I got lucky again in that around 2015, 2014, 2015, the United States started adapting, um, uh, adopting, I should say rather, the, the system that has been employed in the UK for many years. I mean, Jane knows because she's, you know, she's done so much television there that the, there is this beauty in, in the flexibility of the British format. Your season can be six episodes, it could be eight episodes. Yeah. In the US, we've always had this network machine of 22 episodes, which is a nearly impossible pace, or movies, which I've been doing my entire career. But in a movie, like I always say, I'm panicking by page three that I'm already, I've already taken up too much space. Hmm. So Chernobyl needed room. Uh, it needed room because the stories were um, very fragmented and um, prismatic and you needed to be able to tell all those and you needed to take your time. And when, you know, you look at the work that Johan did, for instance, you want to, you want your director to have time to create mood and feeling and movies are uh, just a, a fire drill. You're always in a panic because you're always running out of time. Okay, and Jane, when you first heard, when did you come on board and why did you think it was gonna be able to sort of be financed right now? Why was now the right time for the industry to get behind this project? Uh, I, I got a call, it was uh, 2015, so five years ago, um, from Carrie Antholis, who was at HBO, and I'd made a couple of um, pieces for HBO over the years and had loved working with them. And I'd just set up my new company called Sister and didn't have any work. And it was literally, it was day one. And I was sitting in the car outside my house and Kerry rang and he said, I just had a pitch from this writer, Craig Mason. You won't know, he's done movies and stuff, never done TV, you won't know him. Um, but it's this pitch about Chernobyl. And I was in Britain when Chernobyl happened and I remember it very, very well as a 17 year old. And uh, anyway, he sent me the treatment and it was the best treatment I had ever read. Truly it was. It was an extraordinary document. And I don't know, actually many people, Craig, have asked me if that document's available, because I always say it's the best treatment I've ever read. And, and it, when other writers are like, how do I do a good treatment? And one of the reasons it was so extraordinary, I didn't know what was going, you know, I knew Chernobyl, the, the big event, but I didn't know the stories behind it. But the way Craig had written it, the structure, which was then six episodes actually, and you shrunk it to five in the process of development, didn't you? But uh, it was the way it was started. It was a horror film. It was a war movie. It was a character piece. It just had such epic scale. I thought it was staggering. So then we developed it for a bit and had to fight quite hard for the money. I seem to remember Craig. In the end. Well, uh, I remember you <laughs> fighting hard for the money. And, and yeah, you let me not have to worry about that. It was a great joy. <laughs> I'm still in your debt. Because it wasn't an obvious piece in many ways. And particularly for HBO, where it's a, it's a European story, of course, it's a global story, but it was coming out of Europe. Um, so, uh, yeah. And it's HBO and Sky together, we should mention. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, and then Johan, um, you know, normally with a product of this scale, episodic, you might split the directing duty with somebody else, and you did not. Um, did it ever feel daunting that you personally were going to be able to direct these five incredible episodes? Uh, no. <laughs> uh, Good. I, I wouldn't have it any other way, to be honest. Uh, I, you know, I, I st started out in movies and then went into episodical TV that I then abandoned uh, for the love of limited series, actually. And I've been doing that's the only thing I've been doing for the last seven, seven years or eight years or something like that. And, and for me, I, I really love the format. Uh, and I think also the, the beauty of this particular uh, script, or one of many beauties is that it, yes, it's five hours and it's, it sprawls out, but it has the 
urgency and the trajectory of a movie still, you know, the way it's curated and the way it's written and the way it behaves is so non-television. And it felt like, you know, going back to your first question to Craig, it, it felt like a movie and it, and it needs to be done like a movie. I wouldn't want to do half a movie and leave that to some other dude to do the rest of it. So, so for me, any of these ventures is I want to do A to Z. And it is, you know, daunting in the sense of that Chernobyl was like shooting, prepping, shooting, editing, posting three movies on top of each other. We, we cross border the whole thing and shot like a movie, which is the right way to do it. But, but the short answer still to your question is no, it, it is, it's, it's just amazing to be able to do a five hour movie. Uh, and then that it happens to be distri distributed in, in five episodes is another aspect of it. Yeah. Uh, another good question coming in. Um, I forget, I'm trying to figure out who sent this. Anyway, I've seen it from one person at least. Uh, just how, you know, James already mentioned you at first had six episodes planned and you went down to five. Um, how did the scripts evolve from those first drafts to what we have seen on screen? Well, <clears throat> there is probably less uh, distance between the first drafts of these scripts and the final product than, than pretty much anything else I've ever written. But that's less a comment about me and more a comment about how stupid movie development is. <laughs> it's honestly it's just television development is lovely and movie development is corrosive. And so um, there were, um, but there were important changes. I mean, the, the change of collapsing down really was a response to what Johan's saying that I felt as I was, I was working on episode two and it just seemed like a nuclear reactor is just blown up. I don't really think there's any time to just relax. There has to be a sense of, of great urgency. And so episodes two and three kind of squished together into one. Mm -hmm. And as I often point out, that's when I found out that I get paid by the episodes. So it's a little distressing. Yeah. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. Yeah, I asked HBO, it was very sweet. I was like, is it okay if I make it five instead of six? And they were like, yeah. Um, so, <laughs> well, you know, I mean, it's not that much money. Um, but there were key people involved that helped me continue to push the ball forward. Obviously, Jane and Carolyn Strauss, our other executive producer who's not here, and Johan and HBO and Sky, but also Jared had a huge impact on the script. I mean, we had a number of sessions together and Jared um, has a very, he has a very writerly mind and he was able to look at the script. I mean, this is what you hope for, especially in an actor is somebody who can look at the script and forget for a second that they're in the cast and just look at the story like a writer or a director. And he had some really excellent input that, that had a strong influence on how episode four flowed into episode five and the way that episode five worked because of course so much of episode five is us just shining a light on Jared and, and, and it's, it's, his, it's his episode. So it all had to you know, kind of work properly. And, and so that was, um, that was a huge help for me. Jared, perfect time uh, to ask you to join us. Love the Marlon Brando poster, first of all. Um, you know, when you read the scripts, what did you think about the overall show, but also this character that you were going to play? Uh, my memory was, um, well, first of all, it said HBO. So I was very excited at that. <laughs> um, and second of all, I mean, it, it was just a gripping story. It was an absolute page turner. Um, and, um, and that's what you're always hoping for when you start, you're sent a script is that you're going to be swept along by the story because that's the experience that you want the audience to have. You want to, it's, you want to feel like you're caught in a sort of a current of a stream or a river and you're just swept along inevitably towards the conclusion, you know? Um, and then um, I, with regards to the specific character, I remember living through that experience in terms of, I was in London at the time and um, I, when I was sent it and it was about Chernobyl, I thought, oh yeah, I, I'm familiar with the story and I read it and it was a complete revelation to me. And of course I knew nothing about uh, Valeri and of, and that was intentional because the Soviet the, the Soviets decided they were going to eradicate him from the story. Um, so uh, I it was it was an exciting prospect, 
um, the the character itself. I found it was such an interesting study in anti-heroism for me, in that it was someone who 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 constitutionally was not constructed to be a hero. He wasn't a, a brave man. He never thought that he would have this moment where he was going to have to um, take these risks and step up and be the person, you know. And I I found that uh, a much more interesting study in heroism. It's about the someone who's afraid, and I thought that was a um, a very human way to look at it rather than the kind of guys who like rip their shirt off and go i'll do it and, and run towards danger you know yeah and obviously craig had done so many years of reading and research when he was writing the scripts but then did you do extra research on valeri on top of that and then how did you sort of marry those visions together or go back and forth yeah you always do research um uh, uh, and this one, of course, is based on uh, true events and everything. So there's a lot of factual detail. There's video footage. There's this huge body of research that they made available to all the cast. That was fascinating. Um, when I started to dig into uh, Valeri, I kind of realized that the, um, the, the, the historical Valeri is probably going to bump up alongside of, of Sherbina and, and what Stellan had to do. Mm. And um, and I discussed this with Craig and I kind of felt that in real life, the real Valeri was probably uh, much more of that kind of traditional Russian alpha male, you know, with, a, with swagger. And uh, I didn't feel as though, I felt that that would be trying to sort of occupy some of the space that Stellan had to occupy and that I needed to find a different area to occupy. And um, uh, so, in fact, it was kind of the first time that I'd played a, a real character where I found that the research wasn't that helpful because it was pulling me off in a different direction. And I discussed, discussed it with Craig mm. and he and I, to see if my thoughts and my instincts were correct. And he said, no, you know, you've... First, I mean, Craig has done all this research and he's decided what he needs, what's useful for his story and the narrative that he's trying to tell. And um, so he said, yeah, I think that your, you know, my, your instincts are right. You've got to occupy a different area of the story so that he, he wasn't uh, as, as, you know, you get the feeling when you look at the footage that remains of him that he was a pretty powerful character in and of himself, you know? And um, I felt like, that that there was a there was an element to Valeri's character where he was sort of plucked out of his mm. out of his bed one morning and plonked down later in the day in the middle of this disaster and go and said fix it you know and so he was kind of out of his element really for quite a long time mm. and there is quite an interesting dynamic between Valeri and Boris Stellan Skarsgård's character um, and I say Boris because that's easier to pronounce than the surname. Um, how did you two as actors and with Craig and with Johan shape that dynamic and, you know, were you sort of protective of early interactions or did you hash it all out at the beginning and then shoot it in sequence or how did that relationship oh. work with you yeah. and Stella? <laughs> it would have been definitely didn't shoot it in sequence. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, we shot it in, in uh, the hardest sequence possible because um, and this is, you know, again, a credit to uh, Jane and to Carolyn and to Zana Wollenberg, our producer. We really, I mean, they fought to get us every penny we needed. Um, <clears throat> we needed, right? So there wasn't like room for, so we had, um, given the budget that we had, we were able to do the show if we followed a certain schedule. And that schedule is not um, what I would call creatively ideal. Was, you know, you're shooting things wildly out of and uh, out of order. And so that really is then a test of our director, Johan, and our cast working together every day, day after day, to make sure that they are aligned where they're supposed to be in the story, because you don't have the luxury of doing it in order. And, and for that relationship between that, that is the central relationship of the show. And it was, I always wanted it to be a story of uh, a sort of, yeah, like a, t a somewhat timid non-hero stepping up and becoming a hero. And then on the other hand, 
you had a man who felt quite competent in his shoes and quite pleased with his position, losing his religion and losing his faith. And, and, and the two of them start uh, as polar opposites and ultimately find that they're the only people that kind of understand each other because of this experience they've been through. And they did it beautifully. And, and that's again, you know, Stellan isn't here, but Stellan also had some beautiful instincts. It was Stellan's idea. He, he didn't have, you know, there's a scene in the, in the, in the final, thank you, in the final um, episode where Jared and Stellan are sitting on a bench together yeah. and they're talking about the value essentially of, of Stellan's character's life. That was not there. And Stellan I said to Johan, um, yeah, I, I want to do the show, but I feel like there's a missing scene, <laughs> you know, and not, and and he was right, and so I, I right. that that's why I wrote that uh, because right. Stellan yes. he knew there was there was a there was a fit that hadn't happened. He basically said, "Write this scene for me. I win the Golden Globe." <laughs> well, he wasn't wrong. <laughs> <laughs> no. You know that you you were asking about how we sort of built that relationship. Stellan is such a lovely man. Um, he is just the the most uh, fantastic company um, to be around. There's um, he's a very warm, generous spirit. He's funny. He's subversive. Um, he's everything you know you'd want to. So you're, you you'd want an energy that you'd want on set. The hard thing for us was not to get there too soon in the story um, because we had yeah. such an affinity for each other. And also, you know, a very important part of that as well is a third person, which is Emily. And of course, you know, Emily and Stellan have this huge history together. So there was already this, this great camaraderie already within that sort of core group of the three people. And so that was very easy to, to fit into. And our, the difficulty for me and Stellan was, was actually trying to make a decision at which point did the, was the ice going to break between mm. us, you know, because we had to be kept at odds uh, from each other. So we had to make a very distinct decision about it's this scene, it's at this moment. Yeah. Now that's I want to know, that's what, which one, what, what did you decide? Because I know what I think it is, but what do you think it is? Um, his happened a little bit earlier than mine, but mine was, remember, we actually had this conversation, Craig, about when, um, when I called him Boris. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and and it and it was uh, we moved it from it was like a, it was I forget which scene it was originally, but we moved it back a bit so that that there was a cut. Well, also is a more he, that he made that move before I did, but also because he'd had that shocking news of the in in episode two about the fact, you know, you're dead, you're a dead man right. walking. Yeah, that's pretty much where I thought it was. You guys have the have, this is the. the uh, a little screenwriting lesson. If you have to write a scene where people talk a lot about uh, scientific facts, like what happens to you when you have radiation sickness, try and also put some character stuff in there too, if you can, it tends to help. Yeah, well, I think that's something the whole show we can talk about. Just, you know, these are not just the people in power, their stories. It's the guys who had to go out to exterminate the family pets left behind. You know, these are not just the anti-heroes and the heroes. Um, so yeah, Craig, why was it important for you to sort of mix in some of these lesser known human stories? I think you just said why, <laughs> because yeah. they are human stories. And I think that's how we process the world. I, I, somebody once famously said, if you should tell somebody that a million children are starving, they will sigh and then move on. And if you show them a picture of one starving child, they'll open their wallet. Yeah. Well, that doesn't make any sense, but that is how our minds work. and you um, in something like Chernobyl, where there were hundreds of thousands of citizens that were compelled into service to fight this, um, <clears throat> I felt pretty strongly that you needed to focus on a story yeah. out of it. Um, and similar, and these are real stories are based on first person accounts. Um, and I found there were these quirks of humanity in those that were just so specific and undeniable. I mean, Johan can, I think, can talk to how he pulled those little moments out, but because Johan is is kind of the, the two of us, I think, are obsessed with the weird 
and the strange, but I think mostly I learned it from him. <laughs> I think he taught me to appreciate this. I mean, you know what I mean, Johan? You know what I'm talking about? He's not just calling you weird, I hope. <laughs> Yeah, There's Johan, can you talk about some of the smaller moments that you wanted to heighten in the in the show? Well, I mean, again, you know, great film is about specificity and 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 about uniqueness. Uh, I think, you know, Craig and I both share the idea of, you know, if, if you're making a movie, don't use other films as reference. You know, you you, you find your well somewhere else. You know, and and we we, we also we love. Both of us love authenticity, but we also love impressionism and poetry, and and uh, you know, and I think ultimately, with everything you do, even the story of, of Chernobyl, which is very fact-based and all that, in the end, it's not about what you think; it's about what you feel, and and that's the whole, you know, the underlying purpose of everything we're doing. So, so at all times, you know, you have a catastrophe, and you have a lot of uh, you know schematics and machinations behind that, but. It is about the human beings and how how what they make us feel, you know. So it's that relationship we're, we're after in, in every instance. Uh, uh, and, and luckily enough, you know, Craig and I had never worked before, um, and we we do come from very different uh, worlds in some sense. But it was actually remarkable to find how much uh, how much uh, unity we found in 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 various forms of expressions and feelings and thoughts and all of that. So in that in that aspect, the process was uh, pretty pretty fucking gorgeous, actually. <laughs> That's my um, guy. I, I want to talk. I'm getting some questions in about sort of the nuts and bolts of the shoot. So I'd like to talk a little bit about that. And you know, how many days? was the shoot, for instance. Jane, you remember all this. Jane? <laughs> I'm, I'm, my internet, he keeps saying I'm unstable, which is yeah. definitely also true, and so is my internet. <laughs> um, uh, it was five months or something? Five months like? of shooting. Well, how many days was that? Uh, I think it was a can you Can you hear me, Wendy? Yeah, we can yeah. hear you. Um, 125 I, uh, or something, was it? I think it was a hundred-ish principal and then another 25 or 30 um, uh, second unit. And our second unit was was not really, yeah, I mean- I think it was a hundred and- Yeah, I think our, a, a typical second unit will will do a lot of, you know, cleanup work. And our second unit, which was um, directed by um, Mons Monson, another fantastic Swedish yeah. director, very much was capturing some some things that are you know very poetic and essential and beautiful. He was working well with we had we had the uh, team of Swedes across this thing. You can't even you can't. Yeah, I didn't know that because Mons is quite an auteur in his own right. I didn't know he would be doing second unit. Very cool. Yeah, Johan came to us. He's like, yeah, guys, his own. Yeah, we got a director to be our second unit director. This is something interesting to talk about because uh, you know many times second unit directors are chosen for, you know, technical pickup shots and all that. But what ultimately happens is that second unit needs, needs to do with a lot of, um, you know, um, visual stuff, to be honest. And, and I, you know, I know Mons since many, many years and I, he, he's, you know, a DP and a director and he has a very good eye. And, and I know that from my experience that you, you end up giving the second unit a lot of visual stuff and then they come back with something that is literally not usable. Mm. Uh, so for me, it was tremendously important to have somebody who could, uh, who would understand and fulfill that need. And he was absolutely perfect at that. Um, uh, and he's a, a Swede also, which is sort of one of the main rules for... No. <laughs> <laughs> one of the, Wendy, one of the things with the scale of it was that it was a, as much as anything the shoot was long but it was about the planning and we had a really long period of planning yeah. which is something like this that was the critical difference with many television episodic pieces yeah. like this um mini series that both hbo and sky understood that you know it was going to be a nine month prep period effectively i mean johan you were on for nine months prep weren't you really yeah. effectively from july to april which is double three times what you would normally get and that was because of the scale of it, the fact that it was in Lithuania and Ukraine, the need, the detail needed for the authentic um, delivery of this, which we had to do, and that took months of research for each of the HODs. So um, we had the money to do that from Sky and HBO, which was the gift really for us. Otherwise we could have all really messed it up. 
And so. can you, maybe Jane, you can talk um, or whoever wants to jump in about why you shot a lot in Lithuania. I was lucky to meet Lynetta, your Lithuanian. Uh, Lynetta. Uh, she's amazing. Was just amazing hearing her stories. Um, also, she was very much paying tribute to the fact that there would be some tiny little detail that someone from the region would notice. Like, oh, they wouldn't have had this water glass in the corpse scene like that. And she said it was so open. You know, you guys were listening to anybody, you know, from oh, the lowly intern. We were not listening. We were asking for it. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, again, if we're looking for authenticity, we don't clump in with some random idea about it. So again, the, you know, those nine months of, of research really paid off. And, and the fact that we assembled uh, expertise, both within the departments that were supposed to be experts, but also from history, because many of the people working on the on the shoot uh, have lived and breathed the time yeah. that we were dealing with. So it was, yeah. it was always very handy to say, like, you know, even in the minutest detailed question, like, would you be smoking in this situation? With, 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 what, what kind of ashtray would be? All, all these kind of things, and you'll get an answer that was not in any way contrary. It was just, no, it would be yellow. No, and that's it. Okay. Yeah. And, even and Lithuania I, was because of because we we wrecked Lithuania and Hungary, um, both places with uh, architecture, Soviet architecture, and um and and an infrastructure, filming infrastructure there, and a tax <coughs> break that was important too. Yeah. And then of course we came across Ignalina, yeah. which is the sister plant to Chernobyl, and that that sold us on Lithuania quite seriously. Um, and even though it took about a year to get permission to film there, and we didn't even know once we'd committed to Lithuania, whether we would be allowed to shoot there. And that was the test. I mean, Johan, you must have gone there about 20 times, I think, and yeah. Greg and everyone, you know, to try and persuade the authorities that it was safe to let a film crew into a decommissioned yeah, that was being decommissioned. Some very interesting dinners with the decision makers uh, and some very, very intriguing, uh, you know, meetings that, that we had to do in order to 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 grant, to get the permission to film there. Yeah, yeah. And, and while we were shooting there, we were, uh, you know, restricted in, in a number of ways. I mean, they are still decommissioning that plant. Um, and there is a certain aspect of it that is controlled by uh, either the EU or NATO. I mean, there's like, there's, yeah, there's like an international aspect. I mean, the, the guards have, fully automatic machine gun weapons or you know whatever you call those things. But we were um, always the beneficiary of that collective knowledge of our crew. Um, it was a gift. I mean, I tried as best as I could before I got there to get things right, but there are always things you're gonna get wrong, simple things you, you wouldn't even imagine. And they were right on it, you know. Um, Dyatlov does not bring his lunch to work in a paper bag. He brings his lunch to work in a briefcase. That's the way a guy came up to. That's the way my father did it. Another guy came up to. That's the way my father did it. Okay, that's the way we're doing it. But even prior to that, I every time I finished a script, I would send it to um, a woman who had grown up in uh, Ukraine, outside of Kiev, not far from from Pripyat and Chernobyl. Um, and who was there in 1986. And she read through everything and as a kind of cultural um, corrector, you know, yeah. to say like, okay, that's correct. That's actually not right. It would be like this. And we took all that very, very seriously. I, I'm, I know that there is a, uh, an ongoing debate about writers writing outside of their own culture, their own experiences. I think it's important that writers do that, but if you do, you gotta get it right. And yeah. you need to, and you need to approach it with uh, respect and collaboration. So um, it was, I think, one of the most important aspects of, of us getting the show right and the look right yeah. was that we were doing it there with the people who lived in it. We were confident, therefore, when we aired the show, that what we weren't going to get was uh, just a, uh, an avalanche of people from Eastern Europe saying, "Oh, yeah, no, another dumb fake." you know, impression of who we were by a bunch of Brits and Americans. And Swedes. Um, yeah. And Swedes. Swedes. And Swedes. <laughs> and we've oh, got Frenchmen. a question that leads quite and naturally in from uh, Pablo Millian, who is asking about, and you know, it's a question I wanted to ask as well. Like you, it's not a documentary. You're trying to be authentic in some ways. You're trying to be truthful, but there are some fictions most, you know, obvious is Emily's character as a composite. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not, um, so how, 
how do you balance truth versus, you know, completely, you know, correct or historically accurate? How do you juggle that? Well, first of all, it's important to know that documentaries have the same issue. Um, they're showing you, they're using footage that they've shot, but with editing, uh, you can change the reality of what people have seen. Um, so everybody struggles with this because ultimately what you're doing is telling the story of something that took place over a certain amount of time that is almost always longer than the running time of your documentary or show. You are compressing things down. So there were some rules that we had as a general philosophy. Uh, if we were gonna change something, we were changing it because we needed to, to be able to tell the story at all in a way that was compelling and within a certain amount of time. Um, but never to change things to make them more dramatic than they actually were. That's cheating. Um, that said, because the show is so much about the value of truth and the danger of lies, it was important to all of us that we be held accountable by ourselves to the changes we made. I mean, if you're making changes for good conscientious reasons, you shouldn't be embarrassed by them. You should be able to talk about them freely. And so we did. And that's why we did this podcast. So. Yeah. And it was important to me that it aired immediately after each episode aired for the first time. So there's no gap. There's no day where people can be walking around going, did they just try and convince me that Valery Legasov was at that trial? He wasn't actually at that trial. All the things that he did, the choices he made at that trial on the show are choices he made in real life. The consequences he suffered from that trial are consequences he suffered in real life. But of course we need our, our character that we identify with to be in that trial. So immediately after that show is over, a podcast episode comes out in which I talk about what we changed and why we changed it, because that honesty was, I think, essential to not undermining the entire purpose of what it was that we were doing. Um, and there's a sort of follow on question that I think several people have asked um, about why, you know, people are not speaking in Russian accents. And Good. I'm sure Jared could do it, but um, wh what was the decision from all of you? Well, but, why, but why would I be speaking in a Russian accent? Because they wouldn't have been speaking English. They would have been yeah. speaking in their native language. So already behind that question, there's an element of the same thing that they're uh, you know, questioning us about, which is if, if you're going for authenticity, then they would be speaking in their own language, yeah. you know? Yeah, I mean, I mean the truth is that accents in film is tr tremendously stupid. Yeah. I mean, that, so it, it, was not a, it was not a hard decision in any sense, you know, because it's ridiculous. Just by what, what Jared is saying, you know, are we supposed to feel they're more Russian because they're speaking bad English? I mean, no. Uh, I mean, and, and I remember in our very first meeting, uh, uh, Jane and Craig, you know, uh, I asked the question like, I suppose it's completely out of order to do this in Russian. And, 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 and Craig and, and Jane said, regrettably, yes, because it's just not feasible. We won't be able to do it. Uh, but, but I think in the best of all worlds, uh, that's what we would have wanted to do for sure. But, but you yeah. know, I, we, had, we had a good, we had a Q and A in which, uh, which, which Stellan participated in and, and some smog person was like, berating the fact that it wasn't in Russian. Uh, to, oh, in Russian accents. To which Stella replied, well, um, Ham Hamlet, wasn't, Hamlet wasn't written in Danish, was it? <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, no one's ever watched Hamlet and complained that they aren't speaking it with English with Danish accents. Yeah. Yeah, which I'm Lovely. now curious to know what that is, but uh, I think we, look, we, there is another aspect to, to accents. There are actors who are brilliant at accents. You happen to be looking at one of them right now. I mean, Jared is, is sort of famous for being able to absorb various accents. I've seen him do it and it's, it's remarkable. Um, there are other actors who are absolutely amazing who are, who are just not good at accents. Hmm. Well, listen, I'm not working on this to cast people. Like we don't say like, okay, great. Um, we brought this person in, she's incredible. Uh, however, she doesn't know how to sing. Well, her character doesn't sing. Why does it matter that she doesn't know how to sing, right? Well, it's sort of like the accent thing. It, what happens is people start acting the accent. If they're not, if it's not second nature to them, if they don't throw themselves into that. And we had over a hundred speaking parts. Um, and we couldn't imagine that all 100 people were gonna do the same. The Russian accent in particular becomes quite comic when Westerners are attempting to do it. I think 
by the way, the people that were the most pleased about our choice about the accents were Russian speakers. I did not hear one single complaint from them. They were like, oh, thank God, right? They're tired of hearing their language essentially butchered and mocked uh, by uh, Americans and English people trying to do the deal. It's like, that's not how we talk, stop doing that. Um, and also the Soviet Union was a collection of many countries and, mm. and in countless amounts of ethnicities. So what we said to our cast was, take your accent that you normally have, whatever it is. If it's really strong, take a little bit of the edge off of it. So it doesn't seem like you're forcing the accent. And then otherwise that's your accent. With Stellan, uh, we said, um, your English is actually, a, a Swedish English is, sounds very American. It doesn't sound yeah. British. We said, you sound too American. Just pretend that you're not very good at speaking English. So more of a Swedish accent, which is what he did. And that's how we proceeded. And that's why we have people who sound like they're um, uh, uh, Danish and Swedish and all varying kinds of British and Irish hmm. uh, because that's how we, we just approached it as it's, it's as multicultural as the Soviet Union was. Hmm. But yeah, I honestly, you can boil it all down to what Johan said. Accents, fake accents, generally speaking, are bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> but they're, they're actually, they did actually end up being almost, I mean, I guess by accident, a, uh, a kind of demarcation of the accents that were used in it. Because if you think about it, a lot of the, the political characters were the Swedish, Danish actors who are speaking in English. The, um, a lot of the actors who are using their regionalisms were the, um, the, the miners, the firemen, the, those characters. And the scientists were people who spoke like me with a kind of middle class accent. So it was kind of interesting that there was a sort of, there was a, a delineation made anyway, in a way, about the the way the accents were used, quite mm. by happenstance. It wasn't but, really um, an accident that actually that was that was very much what we talked about in the casting room for months. Was that there you go, you see? So, so if someone really was paying attention and asking this question <laughs> properly, they yeah. said, It's interesting the way that you used accents in it rather than why yes. didn't you <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I mean this is why, you know, Johan and I uh, would attempt to um, thrill everybody with our deep knowledge of the varying British uh, accents. And then Jane would say, you're both an I idiots and you're wrong. <laughs> and also, uh, and this is what we're doing. And so this is why you, this is why teamwork, teamwork yeah. makes the dream work, you guys. Yeah. Uh, we've got a question kind of about teamwork from coming in from Sophie Petzl, who's just, you know, saying the show is, you know, amazing. We all know that. Um, you know, how did you work with the casting directors? um on you know did you sort of look around for each role did you work as how you wanted the whole cast to look together in a way how did, how did the casting directors work and you work with them jane i mean you've known nina and rob forever well, the, well it was carolyn strauss who's my you know fellow executive producer who'd worked with um nina and robert for many years on game of thrones and uh and had formed a fantastic relationship with them and as soon as we got the go-ahead to start thinking about casting ideas. Um, we, we, we all said they would be our first choice of everybody in the world, and um, unfortunately, they loved it. And we had a lot of fun. We did. Uh, Johan and Craig were both, and Carolyn would come over from uh, America, and we sat in a room for many, many days, meeting almost every role we met in person, didn't we? It was pretty extraordinary, which is a rare thing these days, particularly now. But what that meant was, and, in, and I, I find and that also is such an extraordinarily energizing place to be as well, because you have all sorts of conversations about the script, about the ideas, about what the piece is. It just evolves naturally as mm -hmm. these six people sit in a room. And uh, but Nina and Robert are exquisite, yeah. brilliant, and have great taste and judgment. And was there kind of a, a, a clear decision? You didn't want any Americans in the lead roles, or that just happened organically? It was a choice. Yes. Oh yes, yes. Yeah. I mean, th that was the the one thing I think we all um, agreed. I mean, you know, I was not expecting any pushback on this, by the way, but I did, you know, I said like, I just think that that accent takes you out of it. It, it is a European story, and there is a sense of 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 kind of staying within the boundaries of Europe, and um, I think, with the exception of me and Carolyn Strauss, 
we were the only Americans involved, period, the end in any way, shape, or form. Oh, oh and, and our co-producer, Jack Lesko. And what about the VFX? Where, wh which companies did that? Somebody's asking Jane, you know, about who you hired to do the VFX because it looks so amazing. I, I think, I mean, Johan should talk us, uh, okay. about that as well, but we, we basically went out to meet various participants at the beginning um, and ended with Dineg, who are incredible, but Johan, you should speak about yeah. your relationship with them and VFX. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> they were amazing and fantastic in, in all ways. It, it was very much a case of like, you're going to put down a lot of work into that and nobody's going to see it because it's 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 meant to not be a spectacle in any sense, but, but purely extend our world into something that is as believable as what is there the, the, that is real. But we have a, a profuse amount of, of, uh, of the effects in this show. There's so much uh, in it and, and a lot that you would never even guess, but it's, there's a tremendous amount in terms of set extensions, but also on, on a lot of, of other things. But they, uh, you know, Dina was really, really fantastic. Uh, I've never worked uh, at that, you know, with people with that level. And, and, and I, I think they found it quite exciting also to, you know, if you're, if you're a big VFX company and, and, you know, a dream project might be a Star Wars or a whatever it might be, this was the, the radical opposite of that, but on the other hand, you know, really a challenge for them as well, I think, to, to be able to, you know, to, you have to erase any traces of it being the effects wherever you can, you know, and a lot of uh, our discussions, I, I spend a lot of time in their screening room there and talking about, you know, philosophically how, how it should feel and what it should be mm -hmm. and how to do it. So to some extent, I suppose there's an aspect of deprogramming for them because they're used to really wanting to 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 make it into a spectacle. But on the, on the other hand, they have to use their craft uh, at, at their you know to uh, and, and as they really excel at what they're doing, mm -hmm. it was really remarkable and incredible to see how uh, how they managed to to create all these things that that you know I I I, I thought I knew a lot about visual effects and all that, but I walked away pretty stunned by by the by, by their work i have to say I mean, how much I, did you did you have to do a lot obviously you had to do quite a bit was it green screen or in studio and then or could you get some of it in camera that you wanted oh of course i mean we we, we have you know the, the, the ambition the idea is always if there's three ways to do it use all three ways you know and, and ultimately what you want is always to have in camera stuff there as well but there are shots in Chernobyl, which is 100% CGI. There's a number of shots that are 100% CGI. Um, um, blue screen, uh, you know, nowadays it's a bit different, you know, because of rotoscope being a, an accessible commodity in a different way than it was uh, back in the days. So we, sure, we use blue screen at, at times, but more and more that that old blue screen is flung up there and it's there. And, and in the heat of the moment, it's it's the lights have died and the wind has grabbed hold of it. And, you know, Lindsay, my, my post-production, our post-production supervisor is, ah, screw it, you know, we'll figure it out. And we always did, you know, or they always did because, you know, the whole rotoscope aspect of things is so drastically different now. Uh, so you can salvage anything. But yeah, it was, it was, it was an incredible journey. And I, I, some, sometimes I feel it's been spoken too little about the, yeah. the, the I, I'd agree. And it's the teamwork between Lindsay McFarlane, who was our incredible VFX supervisor, um, and Luke Harl in particular, our designer, worked so closely together with DNEG. And you, I think for people to understand quite what was built and envisioned and created um, was really, really remarkable. And how the pieces were put together, what was real, what Luke built, and then what DNEG uh, supplemented yeah. and, and made real was really remarkable. That's the part that you know repeatedly blew my mind because uh, the seamlessness with which we combined the real with the not real. I mean, it was very important, for instance, that we create uh, the outside of the exploded reactor building needed to be real to a point. Hmm. We wanted Johan to be able to shoot firefighters moving up rubble. It needed to feel true. And then there's a, mo a line an invisible line where it, the real goes away and then begins the fake, the fake, which looked as real as the real. And then yeah. there were times where 
I mean, the, there's I, somewhere on the internet, I think Dean Egg has done a beautiful piece about how they mm -hmm. created the helicopter drop sequence. Okay. The helicopters are going over the burning reactor. It's, I mean, I we were up there on that roof with uh, Stellan and Jared, and they're looking out. You know, if you enjoy the GIF or JIF, if you say of Jared going, uh, <laughs> right? So <laughs> we get that. But what we're looking at, what he's looking at is, is not much. <laughs> and then those guys made a reactor, made a fire, made smoke, made helicopters. Mm. It's, and then we have shots where we're marrying them <laughs> together. And it, it is astonishing what they did. And Johan is uh, absolutely fastidious with the, you know, it was, it was as, as somebody who is fastidious to sit in a room with somebody else who is fastidious and be able to not be so fastidious for a minute is, is wonderful. You found so, the right partner. Um, 100%. Just to mention that I think tomorrow's talk about the look of the show will obviously go into more detail of some of this. Um, Jakob Iyer, your DOP will be there. Lou Call, who you mentioned, will be. So anybody really interested in this, I've got somebody asking about cameras and stuff. I yeah. think that's probably best served October. with tomorrow's talk, but I do appreciate the question. Um, Jared, for you, um, you know, did it help though that you are actually shooting in Ignalina, which was this decommissioned plant? Did that help you get into character at all? Um, well, I think we had to hope that we were there already because it was the last thing we shot. Ah. Um, <laughs> but um, uh, it was a it was a fascinating part of it. Um, my my memory of it was constantly being under armed guard. Um, they seemed to be very nervous. I don't know what that we were going to break out into a sort of improvisation or something. Um, then uh, the I also remember then something coming up about there was one of the days of the week that we had to leave early. And uh, and we'd all been told, you know, told there's no nuclear material here. It's been decommissioned. I think it was, it was like, well, you can't, you know, but you, ha you have to be out of here by 2 p.m. on Tuesday or something. Why? He goes, well, that's the day we take the nuclear fuel out. Um, okay. And and then there was this other thing as well because they they were very, you know, they're all production now are conscientious about plastic waste. So you're given these little flasks for your water. And um, on, on it, it said Chernobyl with the radioactive sign. That really confused them because we would be coming out with these flasks. <laughs> and we'd be going through security with these flasks, with the danger radioactive of Chernobyl written on it. And they're like, what are these things? What's in them? Why do you all have them? Um, um, I think the thing that impressed me most was the scale of the, the site, the scale of the buildings and the, um, and the fact that it was it was that was that serious that you were not allowed they were very specific about where you could go how close to the buildings you could get you couldn't get inside the building do you remember there was that issue with the two divers who needed to come out of a door mm -hmm. and um that was a you know a big deal that they were just allowed into a, 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 a you know a double doorway just even that to be that far inside of it um uh, that kind of it, it drives it all home at, at points like that. That, yeah. that um, you know, nuclear, nuclear power, nuclear fuel, nuclear science is an incredibly serious um, subject. Hmm. You know, I mean, even if you're just visiting a site, you know, it's an incredibly serious yeah. uh, technology. Um, but it was the last thing we shot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And Craig, you got to go to Pripyat or to the exclusion zone in yep. when you were writing or, you know, before you shot and what was wild. that like? How did that yeah, influence you? I was in script revisions and, um, you, you know, it's a bit of a, you, you know, to arrange that trip, you know, takes, I think it's a bit easier now because the tourism has gone up quite a bit, but um, we did visit uh, Pripyat and the Chernobyl power plant and areas in the exclusion zone, walked around through, you know, a, uh, <clears throat> an abandoned uh, camp that had been, you know, where they keep um, the, um, uh, where, where the, um, 
liquidators stayed. Um, so uh, it was it was incredibly moving for me because I felt like I I was walking streets that I knew. I had been looking at pictures of Pripyat and studying Pripyat for so long. And then inside Chernobyl itself, that was really just somewhat religious. I mean, I'm kind of, it was rather, I'm not a spiritual person. I don't really know what that means, <laughs> but I felt something akin to it when I was, you know, standing in, you know, the pump room of, of reactor three, which is right up against where reactor four is. So it was, it was, uh, it was, it was very moving and important to me to be able to be there. Um, and we're talking obviously in kind of a crazy year. Um, since the show first aired, I think we're all thinking a little bit differently about, you know, governments and truth and government protection of, of citizens and how that differs around the world as we're seeing right now. Um, have any of you sort of rethought the shows, you mentioned the show may have a new relevance now. Have you rethought it in this era of the pandemic? No, I think if anything, it, it is, uh, it, I, I guess we see just how repetitive history is. Hmm. Uh, we, we, our show uh, tried to be as true as possible to, as I said, uh, the best of humanity, but also the worst. And the human instinct to cover up, to lie, to deny, and particularly to not be able to avoid confronting things that they can't see is, is really where we struggle. And here in the United States, and it's not obviously exclusive to the United States, but we're coming to terms now with, again, we are attempting to come to terms with racial injustice in our country, which is something that a lot of white people just simply didn't see. When you don't see it, it's hard to imagine it's there. When you don't see climate change, it's hard to imagine it's there. When you don't see COVID-19, it's hard to imagine it's there. And when you don't see radiation, it's hard to imagine it's there. The extensibility of the Chernobyl metaphor is um, maybe the thing I'm most proud of, mm. that this thing that we all did together, the purpose was to say, look, we know this happened. We all know how it ended. In fact, that's why we show it from the start. Boom. So wouldn't it be better to not be the people in the middle of it who are pretending it didn't happen or hoping it didn't happen, refusing to believe? Wouldn't it be better to be the people that did know it happened and did caution and, and this way we can avoid tragedy? Uh, some nations seem to understand that. Uh, I believe New Zealand today announced that they are COVID free, completely COVID free. Uh, and here in the United States, I believe yesterday, Florida posted more infections than South Korea has reported in for the entire run of its experience with the pandemic. Florida has nearly half the population of yeah. Korea. Uh, so and that was the day they reopened Disney World, I believe. Yes. We've got some issues. Um, yeah. And we continue to have these and either we are going to come to grips with it or we are going to pay the price. And that is essentially what Chernobyl, that is the point to which Chernobyl comes. Hmm. Sooner or later, the truth gets you. Every lie we tell incurs a debt to the truth. Sooner or later, as Jared Harris says, <laughs> that, <laughs> the debt is paid. <laughs> Sooner or later, man. Sooner or later. Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, you know, the, the longer that that reckoning happens, the more people die, right. you know, so um, sooner is better than later. But uh, yeah. I think the other thing that's, that was instructive is how it doesn't matter what system of government you're under, whether it's totalitarian or, you know, democratic, the instinct of people in power, their first instinct is to protect themselves first. And then once they feel that they're safe, then deal with the problem. And um, of course, when something like this happens, which is so catastrophic, it's almost impossible for them to feel that they can protect themselves. So they're constantly scrambling after that mirage first before they deal with, they turn and deal with the issue. Um, so it just keeps getting worse and worse whilst mm -hmm. they're not turning and facing it. 
I mean, I guess one, not a silver lining, it's a bit crass, but one thing I think we've all been realizing is the power of storytelling right now, um, while we've been locked in our homes, um, the power of TV in, in particular. Um, and are you all, how are you thinking about the future of TV and the kinds of stories you want to tell that the world compels us to tell? Well, Jane makes most of the television uh, in the world. <laughs> so I'm kind of curious <laughs> what, what she thinks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Thanks, Craig. Uh, right. um, I, 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 we don't do that alone, by the way. Uh, we, have a, we have a nice team. Um, I, I, I think it's dangerous to take too many lessons in terms of what the appetite for what people will want to watch in a year or two. It takes us a long time to make the things we make. Um, often, you know, two, three, four years. And I think what you have to do is just follow your heart and your instinct about stories that are interesting to you. As I, when I picked up this document for Chernobyl and then met Craig and Karen, I was like, this is just a fascinating, compelling story. So we have to keep finding those. I think stories with purpose clearly have a place now, and maybe they didn't for four or five years ago. And that's extremely exciting. And several of the things we're developing are, you know, pieces that maybe have a little bit more to say and writers who want to say something and directors who want to really put something big and epic on the screen. But I think you have to be careful to say, oh, well, now we need comedies because of the misery of COVID or now we need things about this. I think stories, you know, we should just keep exploring the world we live in and trying to make sense of the chaos, which is what the storytellers we all try to do. And yeah, here, here. You know, part of part of the the essential aspect of storytelling or compelling storytelling is surprise. That is to say, you didn't know you needed this. Nobody was asking for a story about Chernobyl. Nobody. Uh, we, I think, best understand our current position when we are surprised by things from the past that mirror it so closely. And I would say. Jane is spot on. You don't respond, you don't pander, you don't attempt to calculate your way towards storytelling. You find something that makes you thrum. And then you think if it's going to make me thrum, it will make other people thrum, no matter what genre it is. And thereby you surprise something they didn't even know they wanted. Uh, that is so vastly preferable to being what I imagine will be, you know, the sixth or seventh version of a kind of, you know, story. Uh, I can't imagine how many Donald Trump limited series there are going to be. I I won't be writing any of them because I can't. It's just, you know, much rather do something about Mussolini. I mean, that's how we learn. You know, it's like this is go backwards to learn forwards. I think is always preferable. Jared, what about what are you thinking about the TV of the near future and creativity at this time? I was disappointed to hear that limited series are struggling now, that there's not a big appetite for those. Um, because for me, uh, I think that's kind of the ideal format in terms of the um, you don't have the same pressure that Craig was talking about with regards to features. And neither do you have the same pressure where you have to keep you know, uh, finding a story that's going to perpetuate for five to seven years. And I think quite often what happens in those situations is they they go into it with a sort of Bible for how the story is going to play out over five years. And suddenly there's all this pressure for to put story in and they've gobbled up that Bible within a year and a half, you know. Um, I, I thought that limited series was fascinating in that you could, you really can investigate a certain aspect of a story or characters over this specific period of time, five to 10 hours or whatever it is, say what we did on the terror. And you can really examine everything that you want to examine and then, you know, get away from it. So, I mean, personally, I hope that there's an appetite to go back to um, within the industry to, to sustain the limited series format. Um, I think at the end of the day, there's always the same conflict, you know, it's expensive. People have to feel as though there's there's a potential of recouping their investment. And at the same time, you've got the people who are passionate about telling stories and you've got to find a way. And this is, you know, this is where Jane will speak about this much more articulately than I can, but that there's a way that you are able to maintain both those needs. You know, it's not always driven by the money side and it can't always be driven by 
the um, you know some esoteric idea about telling some strange story, you know. Um, but uh, yeah, that's all I've got to say. Jane, over to you. Jane, I think there is appetite for mini series. Massive appetite, actually. There is. I, oh, I keep getting told there isn't. I well, I, I, for the right ones, there is. I think we've we've probably had enough of a murder thriller story, you know, a conventional one, but pieces that change the dial that really get filmmakers involved as well. And I think, you know, your point at the beginning about Johan wanting to direct all of it, of course he would direct all of it because it's one film, it's one story. Um, and, and I think we're attracting amazing talent to do that now. So I think it's, there's hope, Jared, honestly. I hope so. Can I just say on that thing about Johan, I think it was so important that he did direct all of the episodes. Um, uh, because I remember something that I asked to Craig um, when we met that first time was, were they going to have one director? And if there wasn't, was he going to be there the whole time? Because you really need to have that one, that one yeah. viewpoint that's stitching the whole narrative together. And, it, and, and, it, and you can, you know, I often play this game. I imagine what would this have looked like if you'd had a British director or if you'd had a, an American director? And I really think that there's, that, that there's something so unique and specific about Johan's point of view that he allowed himself to find poetry and beauty, you know, within this story, which is quite shocking because, and I, and I think that that, that that element kind of, it, it, it took all of the materials and the possibilities within the story and it elevated it, it, it into this other level. Um, I think it was very, very important that you had one director and that person was Johan. And just as an audience member, I, I, you can feel that. You know, I think you watch them and you see the through lines, not just with the writing and the acting, but that there's one director. So well done, you. Magic. Huh? It's magic. Yeah. What is it? It's extraordinary. Um, everybody did their job well. Isn't that nice? <laughs> yes. Well, yeah. Very. Everybody did their jobs well. Um, if you look back, I just wanted to ask for each of you personally: Do you have a favorite scene or a favorite memory of the set? I know that this is 125. <laughs> days <laughs> and many many scenes but do you each have a moment that sort of meant something special to you during the shoot mm. I, I can start uh, I, I uh, one of the most beautiful moments ever was when uh, we were shooting the miners and it was pretty gruesome it was several days of rain and clay and all that shit there and our French uh, sound uh, engineer Vincent Piponier had uh, showed up after after the shoot with a crate of champagne that he had had flown in from France he was French he wanted the real deal and we were standing in the mud up to our knees uh, dr drinking champagne on just a regular Tuesday night uh, and it was that particular moment landed somewhere bang in when some kind of fatigue was setting in, but also this sense of, of uh, you know, a, a perfectly working machine. Um, um, and I will never forget that night <laughs> out, in the, out in the mud with our Frenchman and his champagne. I, you, you were there, Jared, for that champagne, weren't you? Uh, I wasn't. I was just feeling that, damn it, I, I wish I'd hung around. <laughs> <laughs> well, 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 one of those. So, I mean, and it sounds like a frivolous moment, but it wasn't. It was just that it was very much the sense of like uh, all these months of prep and then the shoot and we were sort of through the halfway point or something like that. And there was a certain beauty starting to creep in both in our relationships with all the people and what we were doing and, and everybody was starting to understand that this was severe. Uh, and that champagne, you know, he, he, he is a true poet, Vincent. So it, it, it was not random that that happened right there. <laughs> it, it was a glorious, glorious uh, moment, actually. I think, Jared, do you have a favorite moment of the shoot? Or a favorite scene or the most challenging scene? Uh, me? Yes. Oh. Uh... <laughs> I was just yeah running through. I mean, I like so many for different reasons. Uh, um, you, you, uh, for some reason, the the scene where we're wait I'm waiting to go in with the report, 
uh, flicking through the report, um, that that sticks out. The, the that scene itself with Gorbachev, that very very dramatic scene between with Sharabina and I. Uh, um, I remember there was there was there was this because you were sort of you, you know you you have an idea about what a character is, but you don't know the character until you play it. So you, as you're playing it, you're learning. So uh, I do remember in that second week, there were some really important discoveries that um, that Johan and I made about the character um, uh, that that helped to sort of to shape where it was going to go. And that, that there was that scene. Uh, it's uh, after um, it's the scene where I tell. I tell Sherabina that he's going to be dead within five years, and um, there were some important things that started to click into, spe- into place right there. But I mean, you know, for different reasons. Challenging the court scene. Yeah. You know, that was a twenty-eight page monologue, practically. Um, yeah. Uh, you're welcome. <laughs> you're welcome. You're welcome. Um, <laughs> yeah. And and you know, I mean, the the the, the, the challenging thing most of all is. <laughs> is a five-hour movie, so you're sh- and it's cross bordage so you're shooting out of sequence. So you might be shooting a scene from episode two in the morning, and a scene from episode five in the after lunch, and then a scene from episode four, you know, at the end of the day. And and one of the things that happens is that you make discoveries as you play scenes that inform scenes that are going to be coming next. But if you've already shot that scene you kind of, well, that's frustrating that you can't use that information. So um, the, the, I would say it, the most challenging thing about the shoot is that cross boarding aspect of it because you're, you're learning all the time as you're doing it, you know, and you want to be able to take advantage of that knowledge so it can, you know, you yeah. can use it and improve things that are coming afterwards. I do have one memory that uh, I, just comes back to me a lot. Um, look, look at what Johan's doing. He's directing. He was directing the like, light. Yeah, he he he's um, yeah, we didn't get that memo about back. Up, right? Turning up uh, the 12K and up and down there for right. yeah. It's awesome. Um, the There's that. that 90-second unbroken continuous shot of the bio robot on the roof. And so we had this set and the day before we were to shoot that, um, we walked out there and just started talking about, okay, well, what's the route? What does he do? Where is he gonna go? What are the other people gonna do? And we just kind of, it was one of those things where you, you clear everybody away. And then I think it was honestly, it was just me and Johan and David Mianti, our first AD. And Johan and I did it together. And I remember there was one point where we were like, just, and, and we come across this piece of granite uh, or graphite rather. And um, we have this idea to pick it up together. Like, and, and it just, I remember thinking like, that there is, there's an analogy here, you know, that, that it's just the two of us doing it together, picking it up together. And, and, and it was, it was just, wonderful to do that you know it was those are these little weird moments of brotherhood and sisterhood you have when you're making these movies or these television shows that are hard to describe or explain and in the back of your mind you're terrified that after all this sort of wonderful stuff that it'll come out and people will be like boo but (laughs) in this case they weren't so that's nice (laughs) i'm going to be really quick wendy because uh i know we've got to finish soon but I, I, th- there was a moment I just, for me, the collaboration of working with this team and my fellow producers, Caroline, Chris Fry and Zana Bollenberg, and the work that everyone put in, the 700 people who worked on this in Lithuania and Ukraine, and standing around, we had a 90 second teaser that Johan cut, which had no dialogue, which is just a series of images. And one day at the end of uh, filming in the studio set, we got all the crew together for beers and showed this on a massive screen and Zana managed to rent in the biggest screen she could find in Lithuania with a sound system. And we all watched it together and everyone was crying at the end of it. And it was this moment of understanding there was something quite special here. And I think that was the, it was an incredible uplifting moment for me. It's many challenges. We forget the challenges because it's like childbirth, you just move on. Forget the bad <laughs> thing. Um, indeed, I, I think 
everybody watching today, everybody who's seen this show would agree it's very, very special. Um, I want my, my final question for each of you is, um, you know, you spent years of your life making this show, 700 people, you just said. Um, how does it feel now to have these BAFTA nominations? Um, not just because it's BAFTA and isn't that glamorous, but for this show that you've worked so hard on to get that recognition, how does that feel? Well, I'll, I'll start um, because uh, I, have, I have the the most outsider perspective on it that you, we are still uh, children of Britain over here, when, no matter what we tell you. <laughs> it's, I mean, we're proud of our revolution and all that, but um, to be honored this way by BAFTA is, is, is remarkable. It's astonishing. I think, th I think of this as the big one, particularly because the show that we made is a European story and we worked so hard and so in such close partnership with our um, our British network and our British production team and of course our cast, which was largely British and again and Irish. Um, it is a kind of um, validation that you wait around for for a long time. Uh, we are all of us artists, needy, 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 needy little people. And and we do our best to not be too thirsty about things, but BAFTA, that's 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 real. That feels very, very real. And so I'm incredibly grateful and really, really proud, really proud, which is hard for me because I consume by self-loathing. <laughs> but this one, this one I actually am proud of. Jared, what would you say about the BAFTA nominations? I would just quote Oscar Wilde. It's better to be talked about than not to be talked about. <laughs> um, yes, it's, it's uh, you know, you, you don't want to think that that's in your mind when you're going into these things, but of course you're, you're extremely gratified when people, um, they want to honor you that way. So, yeah. Johan? I, I've got, I have room on my shelf. Okay, he's got room for more BAFTAs. Yeah, I have Johan, room. what about I have you? Room. Uh, yeah. I, I think, I think uh, it's obviously massively honoring and, and all of that. What I think is, what I really think is remarkable is when, when you, we must have done something very right when you get uh, nominations through all the, the departments of our creation like this, um, which speaks for, for the process and how, 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 meticulous we were and how meticulous everyone were it was and I I feel I think I feel you know most proud of of the all, all those others you know every every department getting uh, acknowledged and and you know a, a very well deserved uh, nomination for for their exquisite work so it's 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 you know there's one thing to be nominated for something yourself but you know when when it sprawls out to to everybody who's been involved that is, uh, that's very moving. That's tremendously moving, I think. It's exactly what I, I would completely say, exactly the same thing. For me, it was the individual nominations for all of the departments, you know, four or five people per department nominated. Um, and Adil and Hilda and Luke and his team and Lindsay and the sound, I mean, really remarkable. That breadth of talent, European talent, is something that, you know, we need to support, particularly now, those people, a lot of them are freelancers. It's been a tough few months. Um, so for this to be a bit of a shop window again to their amazing talents is also fantastic. For me. That's yeah. wonderful. Um, I think we have to wrap on time. I mean, I could go on for hours, literally. If you guys just want to Zoom me tonight, we can continue about 100 more questions. Um, I wanted to thank our audience today for, for, first of all, just tuning in. But also, I mean, there was over 100 audience questions pouring in. I'm sorry we didn't get to all of them. I would, Craig mentioned that before, but there is a wonderful podcast, an official podcast that, that Craig did for each episode and more. Um, so if you're really curious about more of the making of the show, I, I really recommend those podcasts. Um, but thank you again. Also tomorrow, there's the, the session about creating the visual world of Chernobyl. So you can tune into that or listen to it on catch up. That will also be fascinating, I'm sure. But really, thanks to our speakers for joining us today, being so gracious with your stories and sharing your learnings. And congrats again on your 14 nominations. Um, so we hope everybody has enjoyed the talk today. Please do join the 
the conversation on BAFTA's social channels and stay tuned now for details about where to watch both the British Academy Television Craft Awards and the Virgin Media British Academy Television Awards. So thanks so much for joining us. Stay healthy, everyone. And goodbye. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.